for about 30, 30 years and uh, four undergraduate students, the people listed one, two, three, four there. We have what we call the Lattice Enabled Nuclear Reaction and Energy Spectroscopy Laboratory and I'll uh, tell you a little bit about that as uh, we get going. Now our long range goal naturally is to reproduce, control, understand and exploit LENR. But as an intermediate toward that, we're trying to reproduce, control, understand, and exploit our experiments. You know, a stepwise approach, you know. And um, I have nothing against at all, of course, people putting an experiment in place, using a calorimeter, and getting excess heat, yes or no. That's led to many good results in our field, but uh, we're taking a somewhat more uh, plotting approach, if you will. And uh, we're trying to do, as it says here, quantitative assessment of the energetics of experiments, measurements and simulations. And this arithmetic is um, unusual. If you have one thing and you have another thing, you have the comparison between the two, so you get more than just the one thing and the two things. Okay, so the experiments, if they're done right, can give reality. And we measure temperatures in the center of a cell, okay? Simulations can be wrong for many, many reasons. But they have the advantage of giving temperatures at all points in space and time, and they can give the dynamics of energy production, whether it's resistive heating or LANR, and the subsequent redistribution of the energy. Now, issues in doing simulations are calibrations and validations. You know, you can calibrate a simulation by comparison with experiments, subsequently adjust the simulation, but that removes the independence of the two. So there's a uh, sacrifice there. And um, the validation can be done by comparison with other simulation results and other, other measurements. And I mention as an aside, there is a subject called deep learning now in the analysis of large data sets. And I think that has some applicability to what we're doing in this field here. So the outline of the presentation is here. I know at the top, when I was young, we had experiment theory, and once we have computers, we can do sophisticated data analysis and numerical simulations. Long list of topics that falls into three areas. I will talk about our experiments briefly to set the context, talk mainly about the simulations, and then have a little of comparison at the end. So simulations of LE in our experiments have not been common. Okay, they're, they're relatively rare in our field. This is a uh, diagram you saw yesterday from Iwamura-san the work that has been done at Tohoku. There are many software packages that can be used, and the simulations are challenging because the software is complex and you need many input parameters. So what I'm giving you now is a progress report on work done primarily by one student who's worked for a whole academic year, nine months, half time, in order to achieve a partial simulation that I am uh, showing you here, okay? This is what our laboratory looks like. Uh, it's a room. In the engineering building, we have a Faraday cage for low-level uh, electrical measurements and optical uh, uh, container for low-level light measurements. Okay, so what are we doing? We have a choice, of course, between using deuterium, palladium, and hydrogen and nickel, different loading approaches. And uh, as you know, this is the original Fleischmann ponds. There's a lot of work here towards commercialization. We chose to work on electrochemical loading of hydrogen and nickel because it uh, resulted in a lot of strong reports in the early 90s, hasn't been followed up, oh, thank you, hasn't been followed up very much. Uh, the materials are less expensive, which is uh, good because we don't have a funded program. And uh, there are a lot of diagnostic tools available. So the overall uh, schematic, if you will, of our laboratory is that we can do loading and we will be doing co-deposition experiments. We do thermometry until we think we have something and then we'll do calorimetry. And we have an IR imager, and I'll show you one example of uh, data from that. The thing that we have that uh, is unusual are many spectroscopic techniques, and these comments here indicate how many papers have been done using in the LENR field using these various techniques. For instance, there have been no papers on applicability of electrical noise measurements, only one paper on acoustic noise and so forth. Okay. So the experimental arrangement is shown here. We have a small plastic uh, cell. Uh, a, a nickel tube in the center, okay? I like the tubular cathodes because it doesn't move like a foil, okay? They, they're stable, and they also have the opportunity to insert diagnostics, thermal diagnostics, thermal couples, or even um, uh, uh, microphones in the center. This is a blow up of the bottom of the cell. This is the nickel uh, tubular cathode, and these are platinum wires that are fitted into the corners. Now this is what the cell actually looks like. This is the actual cell, an actual nickel cathode. 
uh, the wires in here are not platinum wires, okay? Um, is it because I didn't think I'd get it back? <laughs> so let me pass this around. The wires are dummies. They're just something I found in my basement. But you can get a better idea of what our um, cells actually look like. So the early experiments were done with uh, carbonate electrolytes, and uh, that's what we're doing. We're, uh, so that's one of our main variables. The other is the voltages. We apply these voltages to the cells, and we study and simulate the time dependence. So um, one example of what we get experimentally is shown here. This is a time or voltage to the right. Temperature difference between the inside of the cell, a thermocouple right inside of the tube in the cell, and the uh, air that you have a couple, a few degrees uh, temperature variation day to day within our uh, lab. So we see as we go from lithium carbonate to sodium carbonate, potassium rubidium carbonate, we get these kinds of temperature increases. Now this isn't super clear, but I see the maximum value here is about uh, 14 degrees uh, um, Celsius. Time constants of the order of half an hour. The two heaviest give similar results and um, the higher voltages give clearly separated curves where at the lower voltages we are not able to separate them. Okay, So that's the experimental background. Now I'll go into the simulation. We're using COMSOL, a very complex and sophisticated program that permits uh, what are called multi-physics simulations. Self-consistent, so it's iterative until it reaches a stable situation. And of the many modules that are available in that software, we're using the electrical module and the heat transfer module, and we will be using soon the electrochemical module. Okay, we haven't gotten to that yet, but we will uh, in, during the summer. Okay, so the results I'm going to be showing you are based on um, those two modules. Now this is a uh, flow diagram, if you will, of what you have to do to do a console simulation. You first specify the geometry, and then you say in that geometry what the materials are. You apply voltages, get fields, get currents, resistive heating, heat transport, heat losses, and then you can do parametric variations as a function of time or voltage or electrolyte and compare it with the, uh, the measurements. So the rest of this talk, the simulation part, I'll be walking through these uh, various steps. So this is the, um, a snapshot of the uh, geometry. Okay, we have the cell the uh, tube in which the temperature sensor is inserted, the base plate and so forth. And then we have a lot of parameters. Now, many of the parameters are already in the software. For instance, aluminum and other things are um, commonly used so that uh, we can find them. We have to go and find parameters for certain specific things such as the uh, electrical conductivity of the specific electrolytes we're using. Now, meshing is an issue when it comes to simulations. This is a plot horizontally of the maximum mesh size. So this is a coarser comp computation here, a finer computation here. And this is the time to reach self-consistency in minutes. Okay, These are for two different simulations, the voltage distribution and then the temperature distribution. And you can see that as you make the meshes larger, you give up resolution, but the times are much shorter. It comes down to some a minimum time you can't avoid because of the uh, necessary uh, self-consistency involved here. So we were able to choose uh, mesh sizes that were intermediate that gave us reasonable run times but still reasonable spatial resolution. This is one of the results looking down on the top of the cell. The uh, wires, the anodes are in the corner, the tubular cathode is in the center. And the good news is here is that even though you have this square geometry and the extremes, by the time you get to the cathode, the field distribution is quite circular and quite well behaved and, and nice. Now, by contrast, when you look at the cell sideways, you see that um, at the bottom of the cathode, the uh, behavior is not, uh, not as neat. But for the bulk of the uh, cathode, it's, uh, it's adequate. This is a uh, more example of electric field distribution, but what I'm going to concentrate on is in the bottom here. This shows the current density leaving the uh, electrodes in the corners converging on the uh, cathode in the center so it's high and then it gets low and then it gets high again. And uh, we can have quantitative values for all of those. Okay, so the heat production and distribution is what we're interested in. We get resistive heating, which is distributed by conduction, convection, and radiation. And it's possible, as I said, to simulate the temperature at any point in the cell and the surroundings at any time due to this. And we can compute the ultimate distribution of the input electrical energy. We can also 
simulate the occurrence of LENR on or in the cathode because we want eventually to see what the LENR power looks like on top of the inevitable of unavoidable resistive heating of the cell. Okay? So one of the things that we uh, wrestled with is uh, getting values that were near the experiments. I showed the experimental data where the maximum temperature, the maximum heating was of the order of 14 degrees. And if you look at the uh, data on the right here, these are applied voltage, one and a half up to uh, four. And you see the uh, temperature values are much higher. It's hard to read, but that goes up into the 20s. So what we did was start out with a cell that was uh, by itself, uh, no surrounding air, no base plate or anything. And it, of course, got hotter and hotter and hotter. So then we put air around it, and then we could see the leakage out to the air. Then we put the base in, and we could see the leakage there. Now we're still getting values that are too high compared to the experiments because we have not considered electrolysis yet. We haven't used the electrochemical module. Okay, so that's why we're going to uh, that next. These are uh, infrared images of the uh, cells taken with a, uh, a, a camera on, a, on, on my phone, okay, a plug-in camera, FLIR-1 camera. So this is um, uh, early, you see the temperature there, it's not very hot, and then you uh, apply voltage, run it for a time, and you get a heat distribution. So what I'm expecting to do is by the time of the ICCF-21 to have finished this study, and I hope to be showing you simulations that match very closely the uh, kinds of infrared images that we're obtaining. Now we can do a lot of um, computational things with this software. For instance, on the left you have three volts applied, on the right four volts applied, three different electrolytes, lithium, sodium, potassium, carbonate, times during the heating after you turn on the voltage and we get the, the temperature distributions such as you see here. So we can look at the outside of the cell and get a distribution that we can compare with an infrared photograph, but we can also look inside of the cell to get, this, to get temperature distributions. Okay, so now let's do the uh, comparison between the um, experiment and the uh, simulations. This is what I showed you already. As I said, only the higher voltages give clear differences. The heavy, the uh, potassium and the rub rubidium give the highest temperature, similar results, the time constants and so forth. So this is what the comparable simulation looks like. Again, you have uh, time, which is to say voltage uh, horizontally, and um, the uh, temperature difference uh, vertically. And you can see that in the simulation, we can resolve the, uh, the uh, lower voltage data, okay? But we get maximum temperatures that are much too high. So, um, you know, you can come back to me at the time of ICCF 21 and ask me, uh, by putting electrolysis in, the energy spent on electrolyzing water were we or were we not able to uh, simulate the, um, the observations? <clears throat> now, one of the things we observed is that the day to day variations in the temperature of the laboratory led to variations in the current for otherwise constant uh, conditions. So, we had to confront that, and we did that by uh, putting a heater inside of the hood. This is the cell here. And um, so, we, we would start an experiment, and the current would as it normally did, just wander down, and then we turned on the heater, and the temperature both in the cell and in the uh, hood went up, and with it, the current. So we were able to get out curves that showed the temperature variation of the current in the cell. This was for the uh, ordinary polarity, and this was for reverse polarity. So what the student is doing now is incorporating these curves as additions into the console. They're, they're not... Um, ordinarily present, and uh, I hope by the time I get home, he will have finished that. So in conclusion, we've, in the last uh, less than a year, since uh, fall of last year, learned how to use COMSOL and partially modeled our experiments. Temperature variation of conductivity, as I just said, is being incorporated. Next, we'll do go to the electrochemistry module. And um, the uh, plan is to replace the nickel with a palladium electrode and switch from the carbonates to the lithium oxydeuteride. So we're using the same machinery now that we've been using for simulating the nickel uh, carbonate systems for the uh, palladium and um, uh, standard lithium oxydeuteride electrolyte. So I uh, appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. 
So um, mo many of you know that I'm an experimentalist, a laboratory animal. So the first question is, what am I doing talking about theories of L, E, and R? Well, I've been involved in this since the day after the Fleischmann Pons announcement, and I estimate that I've listened to over 200 presentations on theory over the years. Okay, but it doesn't matter if I listen to 200 or 20 or two, we share a very common and deep interest in understanding what's going on in, in this field. Now, another concern I have is that, um, you know, a, a single author talk, it's my, my opinions. I talked to quite a few people about theories over the years. I've talked to people about getting ready for this presentation, but ultimately it's, it's my perspective, and I hope that uh, it will uh, not bother you. So I've tried to strike a balance between being engaging and irritating, okay? I, I certainly would like you to get your head into the things that I'll be offering on one hand, but some of them are critical. And I'm uh, among the people who are not happy with the quality of criticism, self-criticism within this field. There's been too much of a lifeboat mentality. You know, we say, yeah, we have enough criticism from the outside, so we're not as tough on each other as we might be. But in truth, we're being ignored. We're like a soccer team before the season begins. We have a time to really be tough on each other, to be critical of each other. You know, not personally, of course, scientifically. And uh, some of the comments I'll offer um, are um, possibly not pleasant for some of the theoreticians involved. But I'm not trying to, be, I say, be offensive. I'm just trying to uh, uh, lay out a, uh, an architecture to, uh, to uh, view this field. OK. Andrea, thank you. So um, the final concern I have about the talk is that all the graphics I have have words on it. Words, 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 words. But I hope you'll find the ideas behind the words engaging, and, and we'll see. So next, ne next, please. OK, so the motivation, there are dozens of theories about what caused LENR. Most are com incompatible with each other, and they're in co competition. So from my perspective, it would be very nice to assess the characteristics of the theories and the status of where they are in their development. Okay, as a step towards down selecting. Okay, so right away I'm being offensive. Yes, uh, I would like to see some of the theories that are involved in this field uh, ignored. <laughs> Concentrate on the ones that are at the best likelihood of really uh, paying off. Now, when you look at the uh, evaluation of L and R theories, there are a couple of milestones. I'll review them, a 1994 paper by Chechen and something that was done in 2008. But I want to say for sure, that these are not the only resources on comparison and evaluation of LENR theories. For instance, here's a, uh, an issue of uh, Infinite Energy magazine, Theoretical Models of Cold Fusion. The two books by Cosima, the uh, two books by Storms have nice compilations of theoretical ideas. So uh, this is by no means comprehensive. So down at the bottom is an important statement. I say, this paper is related to but different than the approach to the dozen of LENR theories. It's not a review or a, an evaluation of theories. Rather, I'm offering questions, the answers to which ought to be able to enable people to judge those two things, the characteristics and the status of very, various theories. So the questions I'm posing are procedural. Uh, I'm asking about the characteristics of theories. I'm not asking, can your theory handle heat after death, or does it handle both protons and deuterons, and so forth. Okay, next please. Ah, hey, thank you very much, Matthew. Wonderful. So uh, now we can act. Ah, good. So there's, there's a review paper that was published in 1994, um, which uh, I've skipped over already. A critical review of theoretical models for anomalous effects in uh, deuterated materials. And if you look at, we have criti we critically examined 25 theoretical models of cold fusion. Unusual look at it. That's nine, five years after the Fleischmann Pons announcement. Okay. So if you haven't looked at this paper yet, I recommend it to your consideration. The references at the bottom there. And they uh, conclude, as it says here, that in spite of considerable efforts, no formulation has succeeded quant quantitatively or even qualitatively in describing the experimental results. Uh, models claiming to have solved this problem uh, are far from it. Uh, we've limited our investigation to consistency with fundamental laws and internal self-consistency, and a number of theories even flunk that. So it's imperative that a theory be testable. So a long time ago, more than 20 years ago already, people were looking at LENR theories, uh, I say not from a procedural viewpoint, but rather from a, a technical viewpoint, from an evaluation viewpoint. Now, at the time of ICCF 14 in uh, 2008, we posed a number of questions 
What is the form of the reactions considered? Does it, how does the theory deal with the Coulomb barrier? Does the paper deal with the presence or absence of energetic particles? What's the conceptual foundation, equations, results, and so forth? And then a colleague of ours, Rodney Johnson, took those questions, arrayed them along the top of this matrix. So these are the questions that I just went through. And these are the 21, or is it 22 theoretical papers that were presented at that conference. Okay, so you can look at this and you can see fairly compactly how these various theories stacked up against those various criteria. Naturally not going to go through this, there's just too much detail. It's available on uh, Bill Collis' website. Okay, so if you want to see it, it's uh, page 476 of the proceedings here. Okay, so that's by way of background. Okay, now let's get on with the, um, with the talk. Now, <laughs> I, I want to emphasize this uh, for very, very fundamental reasons, two of them. One is that if you have a um, system of reactants that can go through a transition stage to become products, you have the initiation or activation energy, the Coulomb barrier, in the case of uh, uh, nuclear reactions. But there's, of course, an activation energy involved in chemical reactions, too. You know, good thing, or our clothes would be on fire, right? We're <laughs> we have reactive materials in a sea of oxygen. So what is the activation area for chemical reactions? You have to take the reactant molecules apart in order to rearrange the, the terms. And the key thing about this graphic, of course, is known to us all, that the scale difference between nuclear and chemical reactions is this uh, dr dramatically large number. Um, I'd like to conduct a uh, pop quiz right now and go around and ask uh, each of you what's the largest reported gain in an LENR experiment so far, okay? Uh, there have been gains all over the place. The answer is 800, okay? Ener you know, thermal out divided by electrical in reports as high of gains as high as 800. Haven't been replicated, but, but they're out there. So with this kind of background, I'm asking the theoreticians, you know, how is it that you get from here to here over this transition state, whatever it is. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is uh, pose uh, 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 multiple questions and talk about each one of them briefly. And um, uh, the first one I'd like to ask theoreticians is, uh, uh, you know, dear friend, uh, how is your theory connected to LENR? And there's concepts presented at LENR conferences that have no evident or stated connection to LENR. Now they might be very, very interesting. You know, good physics, good, good ideas, and so forth. But, you know, why are they being considered in this arena? It's reasonable to ask if a given idea seeks to explain everything or just some aspect. You know, there's so many different observations in this field. You know, I'd like the theoretician to tell me up front, uh, you know, are you answering that experimental problem or are you uh, addressing the entire set of experiments that have been um, done in this field? Now, there's, there's nice work on nuclear structure and nuclear reactions given at these conferences that does not make a connection with LENR. Now, I know the people involved and they are hoping that using data from LENR to challenge their nuclear reaction theory or their nuclear structure theory, they will learn more about nuclear reactions and nuclear structure, but that connection often hasn't been made. And then the next question from my perspective, and again, that's my perspective, you know, if, I, if Andrew Muhlenberg were giving this presentation, he, he would have a different architecture to it, but I say I hope you find this, um, this sort of engineering approach acceptable. What's the key idea? What's the concept behind your theory? You know, all theoretical developments, I assert, must start with some idea. If there's no idea, there's no theory, okay? Now, I don't know if I'm going to get any uh, feedback from that, but I say that's the point of departure for me. Then I ask, what are the foundations of your theory? And the question asks, there's something missing. It should say, what mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology, electromagnetics are at the core of your idea? What does one have to know in order to deal with this concept and advance it to something that is useful to our field. What advanced knowledge is necessary and what is assumed at the outset of a theoretical development? Now, um, there are theories in this field that assume something and then work it out. And some of them bother me deeply, okay? I've been driving into Washington, D.C. for 55 years, a third, a two thirds of the Naval Research Lab, a third of the university. And um, there are issues of uh, time and money and safety and so forth. So l let's pretend I can fly. Let's work out the consequences of me being able to fly, okay, and see how that impacts the time, how that impacts the cost, how that impacts the safety. There's some of that going on in our field, okay? 
And that uh, bothers me because, um, uh, you know, the, the starting assumptions and some of these theories are just unphysical. So, um, you know, I know I, uh, I, I'm of course not going to name names. <laughs> I don't want to be that offensive on one hand, but on the other hand, such theories are in play. Then there's a very fundamental question. Does your mechanism involve only one step or more than one step? And from my perspective, there's three kinds of possible reactions, chemical, nuclear, and what one might call exotic. And to me, exotic reactions include the formation of compact objects or other entities you know, that are neither chemical nor nuclear. They're, they're something else. And there are many theories about compact objects and other unusual entities, what the Bill calls uh, uh, ENPs, right? Uh, so un uh, they're unusual nuclear uh, states. So th there's this question about the uh, number and the type of reactions that are involved. And it's rarely discussed, okay? It should be, but it isn't. So almost all reactions have this sequence going from the reactants through a transition state to the products. And if the production of a what Ed Storms calls a nuclear active environment is always the first step, then all the reactions in our field are two-step. Chemical to make the NAE, the nuclear active environment, and then a nuclear reaction following that. And so that's uh, this one here, chemical to nuclear. But there are other theories that say, okay, I have a, a, a nuclear active environment, then I can form an exotic object, a compact object, and then and only then do I get a nuclear reaction. And I note here at the bottom that this does not exhaust all the possibilities. There are lots of different reaction pathways. Next question from my perspective is, are the equations that embody your concept written out? And from my perspective, an idea by itself is a starting point, you know, a necessary but not sufficient condition. You have to, I believe, write down the equations in order to be able to uh, proceed with the development of that theory. And the challenge is noted here is to have all the needed equations and, and no sur superfluous equations. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if the equations are available, have they been evaluated, reduced to numbers? You know, from my perspective, I can look at equations and I say there's no way to go from the equations alone uh, in order to tell whether or not they're, uh, the idea and the results of the idea are complete and correct. Science is about numbers. Stopping at the equation stage is like preparing for and starting a race, only to quit partway through it. And, of course, numerical evaluations require consideration of the algorithms used, the codes used, the computer ma machine. Lot, lots of considerations go into this on one hand, but it is an absolutely necessary step as far as I'm concerned. My next question is what time histories and reaction rates are quantitatively predicted? Theoretical rates are testable on the basis and they're the basis of applications, okay? So I did a study a few years ago about reaction rates available from experiments, reaction rates available from, um, uh, from theories, and it was very surprising because the, uh, the, while the values scattered over a wide range, if one then said, I want to use these reaction rates to remediate nuclear waste, it's a non-starter. The rates are not fast enough to handle even the annual production of nuclear waste, let alone the accumulated nuclear waste from all the years of the nuclear power industry. So I'm very um, much focused on the, on the uh, question of rates. Now th this, um, I'm not going to go through in detail, but the key question is, how, how does your mechanism, you know, written down equations, numerical evaluations relate to experimental observations? So here are some, I'm, I say I'm not going to go through them, but they're key observations, and the observations that are critical to the applications, power gains in excess of 25, power densities exceeding those in fission fuel rods by a factor of 100, no dangerous radiation during operation, no or significant radioactive waste, no greenhouse gases, and so forth. So I'm asking you to imagine in the bottom bullet here, you have a list of theories, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 31, 32, 42, 40, you know, long list of theories on the left, and then the experimental observations arrayed across the right. You know, and that would really be interesting from my perspective because a person could look at that and you could see, you know, theory number 22, you know, might be able to handle items number you know, this, that, and the next thing, but it couldn't handle everything. So um, that matrix has not been made up, probably will never be made up, but I would really like to see it. <clears throat> okay, so I'm getting near the end. There's a challenge to theoreticians that has to do with what goes into and what comes out of LNR experiments. 
So this represents an experiment. It doesn't matter whether it's electrochemical, gas loading, different materials, protons, deuterons. And you have listed here uh, input stimuli and output measurements, heat, impurities, uh, neutrons, goes down in like magnetic fields and so forth. So the, where there's an entry in the box here, it says that has been applied to an uh, LENR experiment. For instance, um, uh, radio frequency radiation was applied by Bacchus and Letts a long time ago, and they show they could get enhanced excess power during the application of microwave frequencies. And then similarly, more recently, microwave frequencies have been measured in um, experiments uh, in Vittorio's lab and uh, at the Naval Research Lab. So <laughs> this essentially provides another challenge to the theoreticians, you know. Uh, let's see, you're doing a theory and it doesn't ha say anything about magnetic fields, but we know that magnetic fields influence the uh, course of many LENR experiments, okay? So my ultimate question is, is the theory testable? You know, it's widely accepted that failure to achieve experimental results does not rule out a theory because the experiments might be wrong, you know, some unknown or unrecognized flaw. And conversely, if you get agreement, that doesn't necessarily say that uh, the theory is correct because uh, it might be fortuitous and so forth. But in any event, the theory should be testable and uh, the test should be done. And I'm a big fan of um, theoreticians uh, designing experiments in order to test their results. And what uh, Peter and Florian are doing is uh, very, very high on my list of the kinds of things that ought to be done. Another basic question is, um, and I alluded to this already, can all LENR observations be explained by one theory? You've got a great variety of operations. So, you know, here's the question. One mechanism, more mechanisms. Okay, one theory, multiple theories. These things remain to be established. So in conclusion, I, I have a, a very, very simplistic viewpoint that theory has only two functions, to explain the past or predict the future, design experiments. We have this large volume of data that's screaming for quantitative or even qualitative understanding, and the design of experiments, which is a time-honored approach in science, should, should uh, be done, and it hasn't been done enough. So my bottom line, unfortunately, after you know, over a quarter of a century, is that uh, LENR theories, in general, fall short of what is desirable. So <clears throat> I ask you to look to your left or right, and if you find a theoretician, put your arm on him. <laughs> urge them to go through this progression so that those of us who are working hard and spending a lot of money and time and effort and thought on trying to solve this riddle and exploit the promise of LENR can uh, move ahead faster. Thank you for your attention.